actually both me and Mike work at Creolytics, uh, which is an uh, online uh, advertisement uh, management, uh, ad management uh, software firm. Uh, so we deal with a lot of data, and uh, most of this talk is basically coming from our experience. Uh, so bear with me if I go over some uh, details or minor details because we are short on time. So we'll try to cover as much as possible, giving you uh, a high-level idea of how we move to uh, Apache Mesos. Uh, so like most software startups, uh, we started with a simple static partitioning setup. Uh, so we had a monolithic Rails application. Um, we had some machines dedicated as web servers. Uh, some machines dedicated as application servers, and then some data storage servers, which were like Postgres, Redis. Uh, and yeah, this was a setup that I think most of us are familiar with. Uh, we also had a similar staging and integration setup where we used to do our testing. Uh, this was all good until we had some real workload. And then like most of us, we hit the scaling problem. Um, and not only just to handle the workload, we also were trying to break up our monolithic application into smaller services. So we went to ops and we said, hey, uh, we need uh, new servers or new uh, somewhere to deploy all the three new services that we are building. And although everything was puppetized and pretty optimized, they were like, oh, new services, yeah, it might take some time. And this was something that uh, we did not want uh, because we wanted things to be like quickly available, we wanted uh, them to be like reliable, like if hardware, one machine goes down, we do not want the entire service to go down. So if you combine all these factors, this was uh, quite hard to set up by a one or two person ops team. So we looked at some other options, uh, like platform as a service and infrastructure as a service. Uh, we did some evaluation uh, and for our setup, which we had like around 50 odd servers running on a, a like simple internet, uh, like hosting provider. If we migrated to Heroku or some other provider, we we found found out that it would like cost us twice or thrice that much. And uh, since we are de dealing with a lot of uh, analytic analytical data, we had a lot of data on Postgres, and that also was quite costly. And we did have uh, sometimes spikes, so we'd like, for example, added more uh, uh, added more space or disk space to our Postgres partition that sort of fine grain control was not really available anywhere. So we tried to look at other options like OpenStack, CloudStack, and frankly, they were like not easy to learn on our own. So we continued looking. Okay, we thought, okay, we could, we could also have another option. We can buy like some really large v uh, machines, like bare metal machines, and have a lot of VMs over them. Uh, but we found out, yeah, in that way, the hypervisor would uh, take up a lot of uh, resources, and we are really not efficiently utilizing the machines that we are uh, using, uh, that we are buying. Which was already a problem, like, uh, for example, you have three uh, machines running as web servers, three as your application servers, with Unicorn or Puma, and three as the database servers with master, uh, master follower uh, replication. So, for example, the application servers were really used uh, in the middle of the day, there was not much usage during the night, so all that resource was being wasted. Uh, the database also had a peak every now and then, but other than that, it was really uh, not used that much. And the Nginx or the web servers were like hardly really taxed. So we had all this uh, resource that was unused, and at the same time, we, we were paying so much cost uh, for having these servers. So ultimately, uh, we decided to come up with a list of things that we want for our infrastructure. So as developers, we want ease of deployment. I think uh, we all, all of us agree we want scalability, fault tolerance, and as ops, we also want to have high utilization. So we were looking for a solution, and we then stumbled upon Apache Mesos, uh, which we found was actually quite uh, suitable for our needs. And hence this talk here, we'll give you a quick introduction to that and how it helped us. Uh, but the key thing with Apache Mesos, and if you just want to remember one thing from this talk, is that uh, it is this, that it treats the entire cluster as a single resource. Uh, so we know distributed systems are hard, uh, like uh, trying to maintain tons of servers as individual components is very difficult. But what if you can treat all those servers or all, all that distributed system as just one single resource, like your laptop, 
that makes your life really easy. And that's what Apache Mesos does. It takes all your uh, servers and treats them as a single resource. So if you have eight servers with two CPUs and two GB RAM each, it will, it will treat it as a single server with 16 CPUs and 16 GB RAM. And that is uh, like a great abstraction for us to work with because we, we are good at working at single computers, right? So how does uh, Mesos work at a high level? Uh, so Mesos has the concept of leaders and followers. So leader uh, is a server or a bunch of servers that basically handle the requests, uh, the workload, and then it distributes the, the load to the uh, follower nodes. So it is recommended to at least have three uh, leaders because in case one of the leader goes down, you still have your application available and then yeah, anything from five to 5,000 uh, follower nodes. And how the leader uh, works is that uh, it uses Apache Zookeeper, which is again a distributed system platform for uh, maintaining a quorum. But if you don't want to go into that detail, it's fine. You don't have to work with Apache Zookeeper at all. Uh, but it is used by Mesos internally to elect the leader. So if you have three servers that are uh, like configured as the Mesos leaders, it will use Zookeeper to elect one of them as the actual leader. In case that one server goes down, uh, one of the other two will be elected as the leader. So a wall of text here, don't worry about it. I'll give you a quick intro in simple layman term. How does Mesos work? Uh, so Mesos is just the abstraction over your hardware. Like I said, it abstracts you away from the distributed nature of your computing resources and presents you with one single resource. Uh, it does not do any work itself. The work itself is done by frameworks that are running on top of Mesos. And we look at these frameworks in a demo later on. And basically, the, the leader acts as the traffic director, so to speak, between the work and the work distribution to the follower nodes. So the follower nodes tell the master that, hey, I have these resources available. It publishes it uh, to the frameworks. The frameworks give it a, uh, tell the master, hey, I want to do a certain task. And based on that, the master distributes the task to the follower nodes. So basically, it's acting as a man in the middle and distributing work while also handling the requests that are coming from outside in simple terms. Yeah, if you look into the details, there is a whole lot of documentation available on the internet if you really want to go into the nitty gritties. And you can create your own frameworks if you follow the API, uh, but again, we'll not go into the details of that. So if we combine this uh, with Docker, then actually we realize this has great potential because we can run our application uh, in an isolated environment inside one of those follower nodes and let the master handle the, the load balancing or how the work is distributed between the nodes. Uh, but before we go into uh, the details of this, uh, I want to talk about Docker a bit, because we realize not everyone might be familiar with it. Uh, but I guess, can we have a show of hands who has worked with Docker, really? I think almost all of us. So that's good. Then I don't have to go into the details of Docker, but I'll show you the small app that we have. We all know uh, Docker is great for uh, reliable deployment, isolation. So it uses the containers to really isolate, which is really good for us because we have like multiple services running on the same machine, and we do not want that the services should know about the existence of the other. Uh, so it gives you that isolation. You can uh, build the image on your local development machine and ship it off without having to worry whether it will run on that server or not. So it's more lightweight as compared to the VM. Like I, I talked about earlier, we looked at VMs, but the hypervisor does take up a lot of resources, which is not the case with Docker. And of course, it is open source. It's, it's on GitHub. You can see the code, contribute to it, and it has great traction right now, which means that yeah, it, it just keeps on improving with every release. So we have a live demo, and I hope it works. Uh, so let me just try to switch over. Uh, we have a very uh, simple JRuby app here. It's a JRuby Sinatra app. And uh, it basically, uh, this is the Docker file, but what the app does is really simple. Uh, it's uh, hello as a service, basically. <laughs> so uh, you pass a message to the service, and it says hello back. And uh, we already have secured uh, 20 million funding for this. So please do not try to copy it. <laughs> That was a joke. <laughs> anyway, so yeah, 
we have this Docker container uh, uh, defined for this. This is the Docker file. We use JRuby 9K, and actually, uh, the magic of Docker is that we don't even have to install JRuby uh, 9K or any software on our servers. Uh, the, do uh, the Docker container takes care of that, and I have a user there, which is basically where we run this app, uh, and basically it runs a Puba server uh, on a certain port, and uh, that's how the Docker container is configured. So I can do a Docker build for this and uh, uh, run the container, but since you all are familiar with Docker, I will not do everything. Uh, I'll just run the container, expose the port, and hopefully this works. takes a while and yes and of course the live demos are always a problem let's see if we can quickly see what's going on otherwise okay seems to be working or uh, the boot to docker ip or something it's actually back so we have to use boot to docker to run the docker container uh but yeah it was working 5 minutes ago honestly <laughs> but you get the idea uh, basically what I have to do here is I pass the whoa, where is my mouse oops yeah so here is my uh, Sinatra app it has a route where I say greet uh, and JRuby and it basically says uh, hello JRuby back to me uh, so it's running as a Docker container without me having to install anything. That was our uh, demo, actually, which did not work. But let's just assume it worked. <laughs> so Docker solves the packaging, distribution, and provisioning of our application. Uh, but on its own, it does not solve uh, scalability. Like, uh, what if uh, my application is a real hit, and I'm getting 20,000 uh, requests a second? Uh, one single container will not be able to handle it. And if I really want to scale up the containers, uh, there is no easy way. Like, I don't want to run the docker run command onto individual servers by logging them or uh, by SSHing them into them one by one. So that, that is what something that uh, Docker does not address on its own. But we did talk about Mesos earlier where we, we can address the scalability concern. So we can combine Docker with Mesos somehow and uh, get this whole thing to work. Uh, which brings us to the next part of our presentation. And I'll give it over to Mike. Okay. Hello, everyone. Uh, let me switch over to a slide that you may have seen before. And this is something that Rocky talked about before. Uh, what if we had that Mesos thing that uh, I don't know how many of you are actually familiar with? It would be a nice show of hands, actually. Has anyone ever heard of it? Oh, a few hands. Cool. Nice. Uh, so the idea here is that we have those nodes acting as a single computational device, and we run Docker, if it works, uh, on there. So we don't have to have anything installed on there except for a Docker process, and we are good to go. Uh, actually, Rocky covered this pretty well, but uh, let me do a little bit of a refresher on the terminology here because we will be talk, uh, I will be showing you uh, those frameworks, those schedulers and executors that run on top of uh, Mesos. And those uh, can be schedulers, which are, think of them as cron tasks. So you need a nightly uh, cleanup of logs or something like that. You can use uh, a scheduler to schedule those kinds of tasks. And executors are the frameworks that actually run your long-running application. Uh, we're talking web application servers or background processing, that kind of thing. Um, this is an example of a scheduler. 
Uh, it's called Kronos. It has been developed by Airbnb. And we will actually not be showing this uh, just in the interest of time, but uh, it's fairly simple. Uh, it gives you an API that you can post to and uh, basically just uh, run all of your recurring tasks. Uh, an interesting tidbit, we actually decided to run all of our migrations uh, as a Kronos task before we actually deploy to our execution layer, um, which is nice because uh, you know, being compliant with the 12-factor app, I don't know which uh, factor it was, but uh, I think it's a nice way to go. Um, for the Mesos execution layer, we have actually decided to use something called Marathon. And Marathon uh, has been developed by a company called Mesosphere. Uh, it's getting a little bit, the terminology is getting a little bit out of hand, I think, for everybody here who isn't really familiar. So maybe we want to clear out what is Mesosphere. Mesosphere is a commercial company that uh, has their own commercial product built on top of Mesos. Um, they built uh, something called uh, DCOS, Data Center OS, and they uh, actually sell this as a commercially backed Mesos implementation. So if you have a large enterprise and you have a couple of thousand or tens of thousands, I'm not really sure, uh, of euros per month to give to these guys, you can. Um, so that is one option. But the nice thing about these guys is that they open source everything that they do, including uh, the executor layer, Marathon, which is why we chose to use them. Uh, there are other executors, of course, but uh, this one we chose because it felt like it's the most supported and it works the best. So maybe uh, I can show you uh, our little Docker application that wasn't working before. Ah, now it's working. Hello, Jeremy. Uh, OK, so this is our Docker, Docker thing running on our machine. But uh, let me show you the Mesos. And this is uh, the Mesos dashboard, which actually is set up on my wimpy little machine with uh, four CPUs. And uh, yeah, I gave it 2.8 gigabytes of RAM. And it basically says here sh shows that all four CPUs are available and all of my RAM is available. Nothing is being used. And so we can start deploying to the cluster. We can also, let me show you. Here's a list of the registered frameworks that I was talking about earlier. So we have Kronos registered here, and we have Marathon registered here. And a list of slave nodes. We will only have one slave node here. Yes, so this is my master that is also running as a slave. Uh, basically a very simple setup to show you guys how this can actually work. So this is the underlying Mesos uh, that provides that single computation uh, interface. And here is Marathon, the execution layer. And here you can actually, through this uh, runner, you can actually deploy your application, applications. If there are simple apps that, don't, that aren't Docker containers, you can actually use the UI. But uh, we won't really be using that. We will be actually using the API that this thing provides. And I don't know if I should actually, can you guys see it or should I zoom in uh, to the uh, payload? I guess this is better. Uh, so that um, <coughs> so that Marathon uh, dashboard that you saw also exposes a uh, an API that we can use. Uh, we can deploy an application as simply as posting to a well-defined API, where we set and send a body as a JSON payload, where we specify some uh, variables that we want our application to have. For example, we want it to have two CPUs. We want it to have a certain number of RAM. We want to start off with uh, just one instance. And we will tell it to use a Docker container that we have conveniently published on a Docker Hub before. So we won't be really doing that now, but uh, you can imagine doing that. Or you can have a private Docker repository. It doesn't really matter. Uh, also interesting is that uh, you can set up Marathon to do a simple health check of your application. So it will actually is capable of doing HTTP, an HTTP request, which uh, uh, will, it will then show as green if it uh, gives you back a 200. So let me zoom out again. 
and let me uh, send that post request. Postman is not really cooperating on this small resolution. So here is the send button. Let's send this request. And now, if we go back here, now you can see that the application is deploying. And after a while, it should turn green. Uh, we can also look at the underlying Mesos execution layer, uh, which should now show that we are using two CPUs and we are using 512 megabytes of RAM. And it should see, say that it, the application is running. Yes. So let's go back here. Oh, and it's healthy. So let's uh, maybe have a look at where the application is running. It's running on this IP on this address. I have it com conveniently in a tab here. And it's greeting me back with a very convenient name. <laughs> uh, let's maybe show you how to scale this application. Let's say that I'm having a hard time keeping up with my request. I can scale it as simply as saying that I want, uh, let's say, two instances here so that I don't go over my limits. And after a few seconds of uh, deploying, I will have two instances, which uh, is very convenient and very Heroku-like. Um, OK, so we have two things running. Uh, you may be asking yourself, OK, how do I see what the application is doing? How do I get at the logs? Um, there is one solution that you can use, and that is the Mesos um, uh, dashboard itself. We can actually have a look at the standard out of those uh, containers that uh, we are running, and also the standard error, which for some reason has the HTTP requests. But uh, I guess that's not true for you. And uh, yeah, that is a solution. The real solution, let me get back to my slides here. The real solution would be to ship your logs into so an ELK stack. Uh, ELK, for those who don't know, is Elasticsearch, Log Stash, and Kibana. And the important thing to keep in mind here is that your services need to be logging to standard out, so don't log to your uh, log files or anything like that. Just log to standard out, ship that with a log spout, and then use ELK to be able to look at your logs really easily. So uh, let me recap the benefits here, because we already said, them, said most of them. But uh, they are easy scalability, like you saw. I can just do a few clicks, and I can have multiple instances to handle my load. Uh, fault tolerance is a great thing with this kind of setup, because you can have your servers going down willy-nilly. And uh, the infrastructure will redistribute the workload being done. And, and you shouldn't really feel that your servers are going down due to a hardware failure, unless it's all of them. But then you have a whole different can of worms. Um, you can also improve your utilization uh, this way, because you don't have statically provisioned uh, boxes. You just have processes running on your on our infrastructure, and you don't necessarily have to care about anything else. Um, yeah, these last two are very simple, uh, it's all, but uh, easy to scale down is also an important uh, aspect, because you can just take a node out uh, if you are not using your infrastructure. And again, you don't necessarily have to care, because it's very simply uh, configured. There's nothing running in there. Uh, there's just Docker, and that's it. Uh, I would say that, uh, well, at least Ammo is interested in the pitfalls of any kind of technology that people are touting. So let me name a few. Uh, the most, uh, the one that's I think going to bite you the most is that the single abstraction uh, paradigm here is not perfect. Uh, what I'm talking about is if, for example, let's say you have five slave nodes, and you're using almost all of the CPUs on all of the nodes. So you only have, let's say, one CPU per node left. You will not be able to provision an application which you want to have, which you want to have two CPUs. Uh, that is something that uh, it's not really possible to distribute an application that wants two CPUs across two boxes. So like I said, uh, it's not perfectly abstraction, but you 
uh, should just keep this in mind and not over have your uh, boxes completely full. You can have them somewhat 80% full, but not completely full. Otherwise, you're going to run into issues. Um, you also are on the cutting edge, so you will encounter some bugs, but hope, but uh, you don't. You are in good company. I will show you a slide a little bit later. Uh, you usually have good responses on mailing lists. And also worth pointing out is that is the setup is not a simple traditional Rails setup with a uh, puppet run. It is a little bit more involved, and I would recommend having a good uh, operations engineer who helps you with this. But once you're set up, you hardly have to do anything. So uh, you invest once, and you reap the benefits for the near-term future. Like I mentioned, you are in good company. This is a list of companies that we know of use this in production. Uh, it is, uh, I think those are pretty big deployments. I think especially the Siri one and Twitter one. Um, but uh, yeah, uh, usually you get r good responses on uh, mailing lists and the few bugs that we encountered were patched pretty quickly. So I would say it's uh, not really a problem that you are on the bleeding edge. Okay, that about sums it up. Uh, here's uh, our handles if you want to contact us or talk to us later. We uh, want to do a special shout out to one of our operations engineers who uh, pushed this in the company and who introduced us and helped us set this up. So yeah, we want to thank him again. And with that, I don't know if we have time for questions.